All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we will get started with this very exciting 2024 BrainX Community Live event uh, with the theme of having some of the best CIOs in the world over here talking about how do we get AI implemented in, in healthcare. So we're gonna get uh, all of their perspectives and views soon. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a very exciting kickoff to 2024. For those uh, who uh, have not uh, joined BRICS community before or don't know about it, uh, we started this five years ago. That's the first picture of our group meeting. It was used to be in person. And uh, since then, we have been uh, virtual. We actually did that before COVID. So five plus very successful years, 5,000 plus international member community, very active. And if you want to get the, your scientific information related to AI and healthcare, join us on LinkedIn. We have a 2,700 plus member group, which shares a lot of scientific information and opportunities to collaborate there. Of course, we have our website. We have a monthly live session, just like we are doing here today. I'm gonna to show you some quick resources over here. That's our website. You can see uh, some of the information uh, right over there. We have our connect segment. That's where it features all these monthly live sessions, which are recorded and are there on our YouTube channel. So even if you miss it, don't worry about it. You can catch it on our YouTube channel. As I mentioned, we have a very active LinkedIn group. So catch all your scientific information over there. We have our learn section where we present uh, to you the links to all the top level uh, publications that have happened uh, in AI and healthcare. So these ones can be filtered for the specialty of your choice. And because there was this explosion of large language models last year, we included that. So you can just look for LLM publications and filter those through and uh, they are categorized. A lot of us are looking for open source data sets and we provide you with the world's largest repository of links to open source data sets. So we can provide you with the data, but these are open source data sets. You can just click on that, find them based on the healthcare specialty of your choice and go there and find the data for your needs. We have a podcast series where we have featured uh, many of the panelists over here in the past and will continue to do so. You can learn from their experience, their vision for the future, the problems that they're trying to solve. Very exciting to be in their shoes and learn from them. And uh, our meetings and conferences, COVID-19 is gone, uh, hopefully forever, uh, and we can get back to meeting in person, network, collaborate, learn from each other. So, so a lot of exciting opportunities over there. And something that our, our group has done recently, very proud of uh, last year was the year where we put a lot of uh, effort into learning about large language models, but we still need to validate them before we introduce them to healthcare. And we put out uh, Humanely, which is the world's first uh, human evaluation tool, freely accessible directly from our website. You can get that and read our paper too. And uh, was supported by Valid AI and it's our effort to, to help Valid AI which is a, a conglomeration of many institutions leading the effort in applying generative AI to healthcare led by Dr. Astreja. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today. That is Edward Marks, also called Ed Marks. Uh, it is not possible that you don't know him. He is all over the media. Everybody knows him. Uh, amazing person, former colleague, uh, former CIO at Cleveland Clinic. He's been uh, the CEO of advisory firm. He has exceptional talents. We are actually co-authoring a book also together, which we'll bring in in a bit. And uh, he has been CIO at a quite a few different places. Uh, I can spend all day, but I'm going to actually hand it over to him to moderate the panel. And Ed, if I missed anything, I know uh, I'm sure I did. Uh, please add to that. No, no, th that was perfect. Thank you so much. I'm I'm thrilled to be hosting this webinar. Uh, Piyush, thanks for for having me as moderator. And uh, yeah, I endorse BrainX community. I was actually a part of it in person when we met in person back in the day, and it's it's amazing uh, community. So I, I I am thrilled to death because I get to share the stage, if you will, the virtual stage with with three friends. And not only are they friends, but I think they're some of the smartest minds in healthcare. Uh, and I, I'm planning on learning. So my job's pretty easy. I just get to ask some questions and sit back and learn like the rest of you. So, so excited. So we're gonna jump in 
And as I ask the first question, uh, when I call on that particular panelist, they'll do their own introduction. Um, so for a panelist, you know, just share a little bit about about yourself. I think everyone knows knows all of you as well, uh, given your your tenure and your experience and and how you share so freely in in the in the culture of healthcare. So, um, Sarah, we're going to start with you. Uh, Sarah, what's exciting to you about AI implementation in healthcare? Thanks, Ed, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining, and thank you also to, to BrainX and Pusch for the opportunity to, to share on this esteemed panel. Um, my name is Sarah Hatchett. I'm currently serving as the interim CIO of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I've been uh, in that position for five months, but I've actually been at the clinic for about six years, various roles in IT. Um, and I worked, had the opportunity to work with a, a number of different healthcare organizations prior to that, including Sutter Health and New York City Health and Hospitals. And before that, actually, way, way back in the day, my career started at Epic. And I'm going to use that as part of my answer of why I think AI is so exciting at this particular point in our digital transformation journey. You know, for the last 20 plus years, we've just been dumping data into these EHRs. At its core, it's really a patient information database. And while traditional analytics have allowed us to scour that information and surface things for decision-making purposes, that's typically post facto, you know, at least a day, if not more, in arrears that you're able to use that data to understand your clinical operations, the patient status, et cetera. The idea of AI, specifically generative AI or LLMs, and the promise of being able to access that data, unlock that data, and present it real time within workflows that can actually help drive better care in the moment I think is is the most exciting thing about this. Um, the idea that we can be able to really deliver on the promise of what EHRs have been um, attempting to do, uh, I think is, is just super, super exciting. That's great. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing. We will uh, turn to Ashish next. And Ashish, uh, same question, but before you answer the question, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Happy to. Um... First time, a big uh, Cleveland Clinic alumni and a big fan. Um, in fact, um, I started my career journey after my medical school and public health at Cleveland Clinic, where I did my residency, my informatics fellowship, my GI fellowship. Yes, I'm a gastroenterologist. Don't hold it against me. Um, and uh, uh, and then um, uh, after uh, being at Cleveland Clinic, I was at Mount Sinai, where I was chief innovation officer. Uh, that's where I felt really there is such a powerful role entrepreneurs can play. And one of the things that became very clear to me from informatics to innovation journey was that patients and care delivery need much more than EHRs. EHRs are at the core, at the center, but what we need is something that engages with the patients really where they are, which is at their home, at their workplace, 99.9% .9 of the time. And I think that's where applications of digital and AI really shine in many ways. Uh, so so that after that, uh, I came to um, UC uh, Davis Health, where I'm here for the last three years as CIO and Chief Digital Health Officer. So really glad to be here talking to my peers uh, about this topic. Um, and uh, about LLMs, um, we just had a summit for Valid AI uh, two days ago. And greetings from JPM. I think both Mike and I are uh, in the West Coast in JPM, one of the largest investor conferences in healthcare, 45,000 people. And it's all about LLMs. Uh, in fact, we showed if we have to summarize 2023 year, it's just LLM, large language models. And it's hardly one year, right? So launched in November, so the largest uh, ever digital product that came was the chatbot, uh, the chat GPT, but it was not just because of the cognitive intelligence, it was also the human interaction where how just by going into Google, you can just get started. It was also, it, they made it freemium model, mostly free model that led to adoption. Uh, so I think the key things where we look for LLM is completely redefining, reshaping what is possible in healthcare delivery. Uh, we're going to touch upon use cases more, but it is, we can go and completely first time ever think of technology decreasing the clinician burden 
in 25 years of my informatics life. We have not achieved that. There is a productivity paradox that's happening in healthcare where every other sector has gained much more in productivity with technology. Healthcare is the only sector that has lost with technology, the productivity. So this finally can change that. And we CIOs have a big role to be able to meaningfully adopt it, not only from productivity for our clinical workforce, administrative workforce, but also increasing access and accessibility to our patients by automating many of the routine tasks. So, so I think we have to look at it very differently and probably the brightest opportunity we see, at least in my 25 years informatics career. No, that's great. That's great insight. Thank you, Ashish. And Mike, same question to you first. Uh, uh, please uh, share with us a little bit about yourself and then uh, the same question about what's exciting to you about AI LLMs in healthcare. Thanks, Ed. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, especially with this incredible panel. Um, again, my name is Mike Pfeffer. I serve as the Chief Informa Information Officer and Associate Dean at Stanford Healthcare and Stanford School of Medicine. And before that, I was the uh, CIO for UCLA Health Sciences. Um, and, uh, I'll just say, uh, I love dogs, so we'll just keep it at that and uh, go right into the question. Um, you know, we've been excited about solving problems in healthcare with technology for a long time, and we could solve them up to a point like, uh, sepsis is a great example. So you know, there's, I don't know, a billion sepsis algorithms now, and they take you so far, they take you to, uh, well, we, we think this patient is at risk for sepsis or whatever. But imagine that we could get to a point where you should give that patient two liters of fluid and puts the order in, an actual next best action. And uh, that is what's really, really exciting to me that we can solve things like dictation, for example. So we had, we actually got to a really good point where you could dictate after the patient visit and uh, you know your note would come up. Then we got to the point where, well, people could do that behind the scenes and six hours later, your note will come up. But now your note can come up right after the visit, literally right there. So you can remember what it is you did and finish your note at the end of the visit. So. We are, we are now seeing technologies that, you know, not to quote the, the typical response about the last mile, but it really is the last mile here. We are able to solve problems in new ways. And that to me is very, very exciting. Yeah, I, uh, all three of you sort of hit on a common theme about, all right, we're at this moment in time and now we really need to execute and we're going to get in some examples about that. I want to encourage everyone. We want to be as interactive as possible. So do use the chat and I'll be checking it. PU will be checking it. And we will try to go to the chat questions uh, as we move along. So you don't have to wait until the end. If there's something hot on your mind, put it in the chat. We'll try to get to it. Can't guarantee it, but we try. Probably a good AI application uh, there. Although there's a lot of AI being used right now, actually, as we actually have this uh, this panel presentation. But yeah, you all talked about execution and I, I found it super interesting, Ashish, you know, talking about uh, productivity actually gone backwards in a sense in healthcare compared to other industries. So how do you integrate sort of AI priorities, right? It's, it's, it's everyone knows about AI. It's been, the, the whole concept has been democratized and I'm sure you're getting a lot of requests for different AI things. How do you integrate that as a, CDO as a CIO, how do you integrate that with all of your priorities? So this time, uh, Mike, we'll go in reverse order and start with you. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, obviously AI is super hot right now. And so how you think about implementation and scale in uh, healthcare is absolutely critical as a CIO um, because we don't wanna mess it up and we wanna be able to move fairly quickly on this and then provide value. Right. So if it doesn't provide any value, then it's 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 really been a waste of of energy, time and resources. So, you know, one of the ways I'm thinking about AI and is that it's not its own team. It's not its own like workflow. It is everything. So it's upskill upskilling the entire IT organization to understand AI, building in responsible AI workflows throughout everything we do. 
And then making sure we have the appropriate teams that deeply understand data science, ML operations, and how to harness the power of the commercial off the shelf kind of LLMs and other kinds of automation products that currently exist. So it's it's really, you know, making it central to what we do, not a thing on the side. And I think if we think of it like that as truly a transformative tool that can uh, really embed itself in all of our healthcare platforms, uh, I think will be really successful. That's great. Lots of super good points. Ashish, what about you? You know, I think Mike alluded to, and I completely agree with it. Uh, we share the fact many of us are familiar with the Gartner's hype model. Um, we are likely at the peak of the hype for LLM, uh, but we are seeing the possibilities. But what the just the innovation alone in the LLM space is not going to take us anywhere because that's all, hey, this is possible. But when we start doing it, uh, really, we call it a fit journey from innovation to transformation. And transformation is much more harder, much more longer, requires much more time and resource investment and knowledge. So here, if we look at innovation being LLM, what all it takes us to take to the second peak of transformation, the true value creation we can get, that means we first need to solve the problem of plenty. There's so many algos like you mentioned billion sepsis algorithm, right? So there's so many algos, there's so many startups, uh, there's so many LLMs, open source, closed source model. Where do we start, right? And if we start, then what do we, what is our strategy? Where our each health system have certain set of priority areas, or health plans have certain set of priorities. So we can't just go with the marketplace and just say, hey, these are ten thousand ones. Have ten people throw it in and find the most validated one. We can't even go to the papers sometimes because papers may be too early stage and they may not be ready for commercial deployment, right? So we may have to go, what is our top need? So the strategy of a health system health plan does not change, but that becomes the guiding force then to what we call as governance, where we can say, okay, if these are the top things, what are the set of committees or intake tools where we can look at the right set of solutions, whether it's AI scribe or not? And then what is the approval process for the governance where are we looking at how the model was trained, on what it was trained? Does it have ethics, equity biases? Is it really prone to hallucinations? Uh, now, of course, humans hallucinate as well, right? So does it, does it hallucinate less than humans? And I'll give an example of what Mike mentioned. When I have to put a note to my patient, but that is after six hours, I am trying to remember what discussion happened. So there is a certain set of inaccuracy that's baked in our stuff, right? So we we should not expect a higher standard in AI. We can, but knowing that we humans are fallible as well, uh, because otherwise we'll not get anything moving. Then security, compliance, training. Uh, and then always a lens of value creation. Is the effort that is taking us to do all those steps really worth the value? And how do we measure the value? So I think one of the things we are learning is at least no, I feel no organization has full set of capabilities of maturity among all these things set up because the technology itself is one year old to do it on itself. So we have to learn from each other what are the best practices to take us from innovation to transformation, then ultimately integrate technology, whether it's EMR from the decision support on the clinicians or it's a backend operations from data side or it's a digital technology for patient integration, uh, and then ultimately make the real. So there's a lot more journey to, to really achieve success to what uh, our best friend Chris Longus mentioned, taking algorithms to outcome. That's mm -hmm. a lot of effort, which we have to do internally, and no one else can help us except us working together. Yeah, uh, fabulous insights. Uh, Sarah, how, how do you integrate AI with all of your other priorities? Yes, I think my colleagues have covered the, the main things that I would say, which is, you know, building capability, creating structure for governance that that still enables innovation to happen. I guess the, the only third pillar that I would add to that is being sort of an organizational change agent. Um, couching this within the overall trajectory of digital transformation you know, some of us got there, some are doing really well, some are still lagging 
but using those best practices, wherever you are at in your maturity model of being able to, to see IT or technology teams as a steward of digital, as a steward of technology, that it, it can happen in the business and should happen in the business because that's where true innovation happens. And being able to open the lines of communication to solicit that feedback and to, to help drive those things forward in a very collaborative way. I think the CIO is the CIO or CDO is uniquely positioned to be that that organizational change management. Like you, you can still get ahead of that from a communication and change management and, and alignment perspective, even if it does still continue to occur in the business. And I think that's something that again we can build upon the lessons learned from our digital transformation journey to date to just say this this is just yet one more tool in the toolbox of this journey that we've been on together with our enterprise organizations. Yeah, that's that's a great perspective. And as you're speaking, there is a lot of chat going on about uh, actually our next couple of topics, our next couple of questions. So it's going to fit really nicely. And let, let's, uh, I'm going to have one of you just talk about the value because you you all mentioned, uh, or at least two or three of you sort of talked about the value. So I think, I think we're pretty um, on the same page on that, but I do want to hear one or two perspectives and then let's get into the governance. So a lot of questions on, on governance and how you do it. And then I will throw an audible, but I just want to give you all a heads up, just maybe to jot it down on the side, but I want to come back to something Mike said, uh, earlier, cause I think it's really important. And he talked about really, uh, workforce readiness. I, I don't think Mike, you use that word exactly, but that, but you were talking about how your whole team, not just a segment of the team, which is the way that many people operate, but the whole team needs to be um, shifted up in order to everyone understand the same thing. So I, I do want to come back to that, but let's go into value. So um, Sarah, we're going to stick with you on this one. Uh, Cause I know for your past too, you, you've done a lot of this type of work in terms of the value proposition. So where do you see the value proposition of AI uh, in healthcare, and then um, just as you think about answering that, uh, Mike or Ashish, when I come to you, also talk not just from a physician point of view, but nursing as well, if you could, because there's a question there about nursing as well. So, uh, Sarah, we'll we'll start with you here. Value proposition for AI in healthcare. Yeah, so I think healthcare from a service delivery perspective is very heavy, right? Our operational workflows as highlighted by the graph here, I think are the largest area of opportunity. Many of our healthcare organizations are operating on a razor thin margin and the ability to cut costs using AI is something that every CEO in this, in this industry is looking at. Um, so that's, that's some, I guess, some of the obvious piece here. The more, the more productive we can get our administrative teams. Um, here at the Cleveland Clinic, we're looking at the cost to collect is is a huge burden um, and something that we hope to gain some real efficiencies on. The one, the one maybe, you know, off script thing or what maybe non traditional thing that I would say is really about tailored experiences. I think LLMs. Uh, and Ashish alluded to this earlier, meet the patients where they're at. And that is a, going to become a consumer expectation across the board. You know, I have a couple of, uh, you know, younger people in my household, and they're already starting to articulate consumer experiences that are based in these types of, of modes, right? And so being able to provide tailored experiences that draw patients in to your to your healthcare journey and keep them as a lifelong journey will yield overall value to the organization. It may not be as immediate as some of the other low-hanging fruit, but I think that the race is on and that's something that we're going to continue to compete, unfortunately, against each other as well as in other industries to be able to provide that kind of uh, tailored experience. So Sarah, let me challenge you one level deeper and then uh, I'll, I'll move to Ashish. Um, how, over what timeline? So, you know, you talk about AI for cutting cost and I, I, I think you're spot on. I mean, there's definitely an opportunity. Uh, what sort of timeline do you see that uh, to sh start to show savings and, and talking about the value, you know, how how much time will it take? And, and I, you can't give direct cost numbers, but, you know, just from a value perspective, how much investment before you start seeing the return, I think is the heart of some of the chat that's that's coming through. 
Yeah, and this really gets into, again, kind of like a build versus buy mindset, right? Like the, like we've already alluded to, there's, there's many digital health point solution vendors out there coming to offer quick fix, plug it in and we'll immediately provide returns. Um, I do think those are worth looking at as some of the more enterprise solutions or partner, you know, larger organizations are still working to sort of catch up from a development perspective. Um, I think you're right. You really have to balance cost versus benefit and, and buy maybe an option for some of those early returns. I do think, though, it's important to consider investment in long-term capability. Like Michael said, this is here to stay. And so being able to, to see to see those, those foundational elements, whether that's people, tools, process that you're going to want the organization to invest in, well, perhaps some of those more buy or pilots or quick wins can kind of churn through um, those initial phases. That's the strategy that we're we're looking at here. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So Ashish, uh, what about for, you, for your perspective, uh, top AI, you know, where do you see the value proposition for AI and healthcare or top sort of applications? Yeah, happy to. First, I want to double click on what Sarah said. Uh, the JPM briefings came out and what everyone is looking at is how the health systems are going to leverage AI to reduce the administrative burden. Mm -hmm. So that's a theme that's being asked by nearly everyone in Western space and others. So, so, but, but administrative burden is a behemoth. It is thousand use cases. It's not like one use case. So even to disentangle everything from prior authorization reduction to, uh, you know, coding from HCS side, it's just huge. So, so even though we're lumping it together and Accenture has done it, when we start to do it from a CI side, it's too much effort in that regard. Um, the, but, but just to say uh, it is very impactful, 30 to 50% of our healthcare cost is administrative burden. And this is equivalent to most of the country's GDP, right? Yeah. And AI has the potential to reduce by 50% of it. So this is the first time ever there's a chance the US healthcare system can at least try to be closer in efficiency to any other health system in the world because we are far from anyone in the world uh, because the way our payer system is adding all those administrative burdens. So I think it can be a good leveling force, but we can't tackle immediately. What is most exciting is interesting is not on this list. The most exciting, the top of my list is ambient AI. Uh, and I don't know when this list was, I'm a big fan of Accenture, but I've also learned over time to be a little bit uh, critique and look from that lens. If this was written in anywhere in the last year, then, then maybe Mike and Sarah can, can have a better shot at it. Uh, so we look at Gartner's PRISM model. Uh, part of our collective effort is how much wasteful effort would be if every health system, every health plan tries to find use cases on its own. Uh, 150 applications, 150 publications coming every single month. There are already 400 use cases mapped. No health system has the power to do it on its own. So collectively, we're looking at a framework called as a Gartner Prism framework. Uh, so where we look at the, the value with feasibility, which is not there in this slide, because administrative burden may ultimately lead to more value, but maybe in 10 years time, because it has a lot of moving pieces or something, Ambient AI listening to really automate note capture uh, from clinicians and from nurses may be a pretty big as well. If you look at 20% productivity gain, we are seeing from some early data. Uh, and that may be just two, three year journey for majority of us, right? So I would say that is what I'm truly bullish about. And at least I know 45 other health systems who are in some case of pilots or phase implementation for ambient AI. Uh, but the other way to look at is uh, uh, what Sarah alluded is you look at the clinical applications of patient care automation and the patient experience, and there are many of those. You look at the workforce enablement, which is uh, ambient AI uh, scribing virtual nursing in that regard, and you look at administrative. And then the other lens you look at is what can be completely automated, like back office, which do not have a very high risk uh, for a patient safety you can nearly completely automate with the rules. But the things which are in the clinical arena, whether it is clinical decision support or on the patient side, you may rather use AI as an augmented technology or as an assistive technology, 
right? To reduce the risk, like humans in the loop or experts in the loop, as we call. So, which means as soon as you put humans in the loop or experts in the loop, the cost does go a little bit, but the safety goes down, right? So it's a lot of balancing act we have to do to identify the top use cases from value versus feasibility. Then looking at the lens of additional total cost of ownership, which includes humans in the loop, in addition to safety testing and integration testing, and then looking at return on health impact and then saying which ones bubble up for each one of us. Yeah, no, those are those are good good examples. What about you, Mike? I know you, you all are very progressive as well. What what are you seeing as the value proposition of AI and healthcare? Yeah. Well, you know, I again I, I think these are all really great points. Um health IT has not delivered on reducing costs of healthcare, right? It just hasn't. Um, costs have gone up. It's not, I think, directly related to health IT, especially because healthcare spends the lowest percentage on IT of basically any industry. Uh, you go to the finance industry, it's more than double what they spend on IT. So one, one thing we have to, I think, think about is if we're really going to take this seriously, we have to look at what does healthcare actually spend on automation and information technology. That I think is is really create. We can't keep. We can't do more and more and more if we just have the same things because there's other stuff we've got to do too. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Second is values, not just money. Right? We talk quality. Um, we talk about burnout. Like if if we're going to Im implement ambient voice across healthcare it shouldn't come with the caveat that everybody needs to see four more patients a day, right? We, we, we actually have to use this technology to get back to some level of uh, well-being for all those in, in healthcare, nurses, physicians, the list goes on and on and on. So here's an opportunity to kind of get back to where we need to be. And I think that's very valuable. We may not save any money, it may actually cost us more, but the hidden cost of turnover is enormous. Uh, employee, you know, one turnover of employee could be hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. So if we can reduce turnover and reduce burnout, that's an incredible amount of value. That's not going to be reflected in any of these numbers because it isn't, you know, reducing labor, which is where a lot of these numbers come from, right? And then finally, I'll say we've heard this story before. Robotic process automation is a great example dare I say blockchain, these are going to change healthcare. I think the, the most important thing is we have a framework that we stick to that helps us really determine value. Yeah. And uh, at, at Stanford, we have something called the firm assessment, but fundamentally what it is, is we take an AI application, we run it through a five-year you know, total cost of ownership, and we see, does this produce the value that we want, whether it's you know, reducing costs, whether it's improving quality, whether it's reducing burnout, whatever it is. And then we can, then we will measure that over time. And if it doesn't work, guess what? We turn it off. So I think being really good this time about measuring how these technologies are working is going to lead us, I think, to a greater value proposition. Yeah. But let's not get into the same, you know, problem that's been in the past, which is more applications, more products, more money, increased costs, no change in value. Yeah, all super, super good points. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the chat. Yeah, and I and I think uh, a couple of you alluded to it. It's just using AI and especially Mike there in the last um, minute or so, you know, leveraging AI reduce uh, clinician burnout and the burnout on everyone, the burdens of administrivia. I think you all uh, talked about. So the the other area of interest and happens to be our next question is all around governance and then uh, also uh, ethics. And so I want, I want to jump into that. And th there was some chat earlier too about how is your governance set up? So, so that might be the first uh, thing to answer. Is it like, do you have a governance for AI or is it just part of your normal governance process? And then, you know, the whole, how do you balance the, the ethics uh, when it comes to AI? So uh, Sarah, we'll start with you. So, how, how is your, do you have a separate governance for AI? How do you handle it? Is it, is it uniquely different? And then how do you just balance governance and ethics in general? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and keep it short because I uh, know we have a lot to cover. And, and 
it is separate governance, but it's not any different in the way that we structure it. The best practices around governance should be the same. There's sort of a steering level that sets the overall priorities and roadmap and engages the business in that, that kind of value prop conversation. Then there's more of a task force level that are like reviewing the specific use cases of AI, everything from, you know, predictive models to, you know, embedded in applications and just that's a cross-disciplinary team that brings to bear all of that legal compliance and, and ethics type consideration. Um, I think the question we're having is how do you do it at scale? Um, you know, governance at scale is something we've always traditionally had a problem with in IT because there's just so many requests coming in from the business and being able to kind of like manage the overall portfolio is a challenge. This will be no different. So um, making sure that you've got the right people there that are willing to commit the time to be able to get this up and off the ground while not, you know, creating many, many, many roadblocks that will end up stifling innovation will be will be absolutely important to get the right balance down. Good point. Mike, what about at Stanford? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, we do have a governance group. It's called the Data Science Executive Committee. Um, it's actually uh, has our CEO and our dean on it. That's how important this is. And we use the framework that I mentioned so we can present an objective view to every single AI application that we would put into production. So every single AI application will pass through this committee. Now, that that's going to have to be risk-based, obviously, because there's going to be a lot of these things. So low-risk things might be more of an FYI all the way to, you know, things that are going to have to be decided that we're going to put in and how that's going to be uh, surface to the community. So we are very serious that we are going to have a, a, a committee review and make those determinations about what it is we should put into the environment. And then that committee is responsible for reviewing the measurements of how these things are performing. Um, and so that is uh, how we've structured it. And, you know, I'm sure it'll go through iterations as we learn more, but uh, it's really important to me that uh, this is a high level committee that is focused on, uh, it, 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 it sits on the foundation of Stanford's integrated strategic plan, our Raise Health initiative, which is about responsible AI, and our health systems operational plan. Those are the foundational pieces. If it doesn't hit any of those things, then it's probably not what we should do. So, it, so the foundations, the frameworks, and everything passes through this committee. They all have such unique perspectives. I I, I I hit every one of you on every question, uh, which I wasn't planning to do, but you you all have these uh, great inputs. And I think the audience is really getting a lot out of it based on the chat. So uh, Ashish, to you, same question. Yeah. So I think uh, we have a health data oversight committee uh, and within that analytics oversight subcommittee, uh, uh, which has representation from School of Medicine, School of Nurses, faculty member, researchers, as well as IT and other strategic folks, uh, which reviews all the AI algorithms that's coming. In fact, we are now mandated by law with an order from um, the governor's office uh, and attorney general in California to do that for fairness in that regard. So I think we have those committees in place for five years or so. Uh, sepsis algorithms, all those things come as well as uh, uh, commercial off-the-shelf applications from that, even if they're FTA approved. But we have started facing two, realizing two challenges are there. Uh, one is, you know, the committees are all based on volunteer effort and some dedicated time. We are seeing there is so much more need to pass through things to that than the committees can handle. So suddenly there is a bottleneck that's happened, not because they're not mission-driven people, it's just that we don't have capacity in those committees to do it. Because it's, it's a really a lot of effort to look at all the data from a training data set to equity, to fairness, to look at all the publications and compare with our population and see it's the right one to make an impact, especially on clinical one. That's a huge amount of effort. And this is all volunteer effort right now, right? The other, so what the other challenge we are facing is, uh, uh, or a kind of on a similar note, not only we are doing, we have this process baked into University of California policies. We are mandated to set up STO uh, health data oversight. 
all the six health systems within UC. So that's one legal, we're all legally UCLA, UCSF, um, UC San Diego, UC Irvine, UC Riverside, and UC Davis are one legal entity. Uh, but we're all doing things in parallel. Think of the biggest inefficiency, right? It's really all the algorithms are going to come in. We're already starving. And it's many of the algorithms are common. So we have started kind of looking at a framework. How can we create a highway that if UCLA has approved something, then it goes through a fast track process for UC Davis Health, really decreasing the burden. And now under open innovation, we're opening that through Valid AI Collective of 50 health systems that will open that in a bank to other health system health plans. So if they see these are already vetted through in these committees, we have never ever shared our committee work outside our organization in any capacity. We're doing enormous work. We need to make it open for society. Now it doesn't cannot be exact minutes or exact deliberations, but maybe a high level summary, whatever legally is allowed. But we we have, I, I would say a, a responsibility to make everyone efficient in every other health system efficient in this game as well, because together we will rise. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a big, big opportunity, I feel. Yeah, and I, just to summarize this particular question, you all have three have different approaches, but the commonalities is that you have an approach, uh, there's a structure and your CEOs are engaged, which I loved, um, and and nursing as well. And, and you know, I can tell you from a, as a board member of a couple of health systems, uh, I mean, that's become top of mind as well at the board, always asking the CEO, you know, for updates on on AI related activities. So it's coming uh, from a lot of different places, but it's great. And I'm not surprised that you'll have some structure in place. So, okay, we talked about governance and uh, somewhat a little bit about ethics, but who's paying uh, for implementation AI to healthcare? We sort of talked about it on the, when we talked about, you know, the value proposition, but, um, you know, who pays for the implementation of the of AI at healthcare organizations? So Ashish, well, I know you just ended the last question, but we'll start with you, go in reverse order. Uh, the toughest question. Uh, I'm, I'm, you're gonna see a lot of heterogeneity here. Uh, uh, I, I can say what is right now may be different, what may shape up in a few years from now, but in general, it's a hybrid. Um, so some of those, ultimately you can see some of those AI algorithms can, hopefully will be paid by health insurance because they are deemed to be so valuable for patient safety and efficiency. Uh, for example, some of the prior authorization algorithms, if that's there. Right now it's opposite. It's uh, leading to friction, the bot against the bot of prior authorization. Hopefully we'll reach a synergy where some of those will get funded through the payers and that will be baked into products which are you know universally accepted in that regard. But I do feel it cannot just come from IT alone, right? Now, if it comes from IT, we'd probably be 40% of the budget <laughs> of the healthcare. Uh, right now, most of the IT budgets are 5 to 8% and not more than that, right? So, so we are uh, working on a model, uh, like we have a very active radiology informatics group. We're working on a model where if you look at the total cost of care, maybe a part of that can be done by the uh, implementation team of IT, which is integration, implementation, and some of the value creation. But maybe the algorithm needs to be a joint effort, joint supported by the departments and the division. And for two reasons, first there needs to be skin in the game. So uh, to create the maximum value because there's so much problem of plenty, we need to align all the people, not only for shared decision-making, but also for shared executive sponsorship. The chiefs and the chairs, the school of medicine, school of nursing and the medical center doing things together. But it also depends on the use case. For example, if the use case of the AI algorithm is completely automation of revenue cycle, right? Then you can find executive sponsor as a CFO, right? And some of the part we may have to lend from the IT side. So I think a lot depends on, and for example, for the ambient scribe, we have our medical board actually sponsoring that initially, right? So I think it's gonna be, what is the purpose of that? And for that purpose, which organization unit mandate is in that direction? And do we have executive sponsor in that which is willing? One of the models which has been working good for us and we are planning to expand it more is joint executive sponsorship. And I think that may lend very itself to say, we are happy to do heavy lifting in that regard, but we want other organization units to really invest into it together. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. What about you, Mike? 
What's your well, perspective? I, I, I agree with the sheet. I'm, I'm going to go macro on this. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, I forget who mentioned this, but, you know, margins at health systems across the country are not good. I think we're up to three quarters of hospitals have margins that are negative um, last year. So if healthcare organizations have to pay to implement AI and derive value, we're going to be in trouble because this stuff isn't cheap. Every company who is producing something in AI is not going to give it to us for free. <laughs> so, so from a, from a health equity standpoint, we have to figure out a way where there's not haves and have nots. You, you, you can't, we shouldn't get to a situation where, you know, if you're very unlikely and you end up needing emergency care and you're in an ambulance and the ambulance makes a left turn and goes to hospital A and they're using AI and you get a better diagnosis faster than the, uh, the ambulance makes a right turn and goes to hospital B, then we've failed. And I don't have a good answer for how to fix that, right? But when we talk about ethics and we talk about health equity, um, this is a little bit of a different lens. It's, 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 you shouldn't have to choose a facility because it can do AI and another one can't if we show and when we show that AI is actually proved, it can improve care. And so I don't know how to solve that, but to Shisha's point, we got to do this as a community. This can't be every health system going at it by themselves. And so I, I, I think um, as we show that AI can improve outcomes um, for health, then that should be something that we figure out on how to deploy everywhere. Um, and so I, I would love to hear from anybody on this you know, panel how we can begin to make sure that happens uh, because yeah. that's, really, that's really what's gonna transform healthcare for this country. Uh, well said, Sarah, what, what's your perspective on who pays for AI in healthcare? Yeah, I certainly don't have the answers either, but I mean, my early thinking is, you know, who doesn't have as tight margins is our strategic partners, our Microsofts, our Epics, our, you know, powerhouse development shops that can actually include this stuff with favorable licensing, with favorable subscriptions, knowing at what, you know, what a pinch we are at. If they truly want us to adopt these technologies and continue to invest in, in those strategic partnerships, I, I feel it's important that we put pressure on those um, strategic partners and providers to, to, to think about health equity in, in those regards. I, the problem is, is those partners are typically the hardest to deal with from a contractual standpoint. And, and to Michael's point, nothing's for free, but whether, you know, whether I, I, I apologize. I'm probably going to get down a tangent on here, but whether Microsoft provides a co-pilot to 300 versus 3,000 of my of my enterprise organizations, there's very little marginal cost for them, but it would be significant margins for me to be able to make that investment. So we be able, you know, we need to be able to have those strategic conversations, yeah. and that's where the CIO role comes in. That's where we can advocate on behalf of our organizations to really put pressure on our providers to do that. Um, as far as at our organization, um, you know, there still has to be a business case for every single thing that we do, getting back to the value prop that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, there's certainly an opportunity for the business to bring forward a funding request to, to secure the funding. Um, we do control procurement through through IT. So, you know, any any technology contract A or I otherwise needs to have sort of IT's review and blessing, but Theoretically, that funding could come from the business, and we have seen some really forward-thinking business units like marketing. Those that don't seem to be constrained by some of the the regulatory or you know ethics or um, other healthcare-related concerns because they're just dealing with content. Um, you know that they've been able to move forward and have have gained quite a bit of success in in building business cases and getting funding around um, early AI tools beyond just um, patient care-related things. So. Um, the, the, the piece that I think many organizations will struggle with is this foundational capability that we've talked about, right? Building out the teams, growing your data science team, getting the right cloud tools, getting the, those, those sorts of things aren't neatly wrapped in any one business case. They're not any one digital health point solution. 
And so the sooner that organizations will recognize that some investment is needed if you want to be able to leverage you know, in-house development capabilities, um, that that should be centralized in the, um, because those resources are so scarce and they'll need to be appropriately leveraged to, to be able to scale. Uh, that's something that, I, again, uh, I'm hoping many executive teams are coming to the realization that um, it doesn't fit neatly into any one business case and will have to be a, an overall strategic investment. Yeah, super good perspectives. We're down to 10 minutes and we're going to hit a lightning round here shortly. So if there's anything else from the audience, put it in the chat. If if there is interest in workforce, I had mentioned that earlier uh, based on a comment Mike had made, put it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, we may not hit it. And we're going to keep going uh, with one more question for lightning round. So feel free to add anything else in the chat. So obviously, there's a lot of excitement around around AI and people are really enthused. I know you get hit up all the time and we talked about value prop and you have a governance mechanism and that sort of thing. But in general, like when you interact with your peers or others in the organization, how do you maintain the organizational enthusiasm while at the same time you sort of level set expectations, you know, cause we talked about, you know, we had a, what a blockchain and you know, we know an RPA was going to solve the world's problems, but, um, how do you do that? How do you balance that? I'd be super curious on your approaches, like in 60 seconds or less. Um, so we'll start, Sarah, we'll start with you and then I'll go to Mike and Ashish. Yeah. So I've already talked a little bit about pilots, like getting some quick wins in. I think that's really important. Um, the The piece that I would advocate for here as well, though, is to be a learning organization. Let's not just pilot for, to say that we're doing stuff. We We want a pilot to actually gain some real learning around how these tools can benefit us and how to implement them properly. So doing things like very structured lessons learned and an organizational review on that process in, in all of these contexts will be very, very important. All right, Mike, and you, yourself? Yeah, I just think getting some tools out quickly that are low risk and with the idea of we're all going to learn from them. So if they're not going to work perfectly. Let us know how they're working. Let's get feedback. But getting getting hands on the tools, I think will be a good way to start, which will give us time to really look at everything out there and say, where should we go next? Uh, we've got so much in the pipeline, both coming from our faculty who have developed models to uh, in-house development to vendor solutions, the list goes on and on. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're choosing things, but but appropriately but you know getting getting some early wins uh of this technology out i think is a, a nice way to start that's good yeah ashish yeah i think uh, what chat gpt has showed is consumer success um and sometimes people say oh now the technology is here i should be seeing in my hospital but i think there's a lot of communication that needs to happen that consumer success doesn't have to go through all this ethics uh, privacy, all these constraints, New York Times just sued OpenAI for using its articles, right? And uh, Google engineers just found they can spit out the old, uh, uh, the data that was training data. So we, this is a much more different uh, orchestration we have to do. So I feel we are getting into the biggest digital divide within our organization. Where understanding of some of our CEOs are amazing but not every faculty member is at the same level of understanding. So we, and that is the arm which we had not developed as a CIO. Uh, so what we did in the Epic time or EMR time, we need to set up champions. We need to have communication briefings. So people know what's coming and rapidly they learn. So we also started Digital Davis Transformation Day. So people can come and actually we can share success story like uh, low hanging fruits, what Mike mentioned. And then we brought for our event in JPM for Valid AI, we had a full bus shuttle from Sacramento to San Fran, our executives, our clinical people and researchers and IT people. And they, the, I got so much comments. They said, this is the biggest joy they had seen, right? Being able to connect with where the things are going. So I think everyone can be a transformation agent. That's the power of AI and generative AI. And a part of our thinking and effort as CIOs and leaders need to be investing into doing that, bringing everyone on board internally in knowledge part and then value creation. All right, I'm gonna do a lightning round. We're down to five minutes. So I definitely wanna give each of the panelists a last word. Uh, so I wanna get through lightning round, lightning round pretty, pretty quick. So before I hit this one, um, 
because this one came up in the chat. So in, in uh, 20 seconds each, uh, your favorite app, AI sort of related that you use like personally, and then the favorite app that you're using, you know, for the organization. And, and we, we won't define favorite. Uh, we'll just assume that it's something that's working for everyone and all that kind of stuff. So Ashish, we'll stick with you. So your favorite personal app and, uh, you know, what's, what's your favorite that you're using at work? My favorite personal app is WhatsApp that allows me to talk to my dad and my family nearly every day and connect in a way, even though I'm 5,000 miles away. So it's, 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 that's, that's my favorite one. And all, I'm connected with all my medical school and other friends through WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups. So that's, I think the human connection with my powering is just amazing. Uh, my favorite enterprise app is actually, believe it or not, Microsoft Teams, uh, because it is now allowing us in an asynchronous way to chat with anyone. I get uh, so many messages from IT people, other leaders, thoughts and others. And it's just amazingly bringing in productivity. I can't wait for Copilot to kind of take us to the next stage, but that's really becoming an operational communication DNA for our organization. All right, Mike, you 30 seconds. I'll go with the telephone. Um, I love talking to people. I, I think as technologists, we have to push really hard that relationships matter and relationships aren't formed through text messaging. They're really formed through conversation. And if that third email hasn't resolved the issue, pick up the telephone and get to know the person on the other line. Uh, and there's a lot of artificial, there's a lot of intelligence behind the phone call conversation mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. Uh, so that's my favorite. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm really excited about ambient voice technology as a big win for our providers, nurses, uh, and physicians. So that, that's the one I'm really excited about. And our initial pilots are proving that out. So uh, that would be my favorite app. Super. Sarah, for you, 30 seconds. As far as AI is concerned, um, you know, one of my favorite apps is one my daughter actually uses. It's called character.ai. It's you can actually interact with characters in a conversational mode using um, using your your mobile device. And she really, she's 13 and she creates these entire creative worlds and narratives, um, taking on different personas and exploring things. And I thought, man, if I had that as a, as a kid, you know, I would just open up new worlds of, of, of thinking. And, and she's also actually improving her creative skills and being able to construct narratives and stories. And so I think I'm forecasting into the future. Again, I, I mentioned this earlier, the idea of those, um, younger generations entering our both our workforce, uh, both as as IT leaders, but also as as patients and caregivers. I I just I'm super excited about um the ability to to see those inter those early interactions being able to shape kind of the future of of, of healthcare. No, that sounds interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to look up that app. All right. So uh, the last question you see here is a one word um, it only, only can be one word and we'll go through and then we'll finish on, on this book opportunity for everyone. Um, so, uh, Sarah, uh, the one word, most optimistic word of 2024. Uh, reimagining. Love it. Uh, Mike. I'll go with, uh, transformation. Awesome. And, uh, sheesh, if he's still there. I think I think he might have dropped. Yeah, yeah, we might have had to drop up. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. The last slide, thank you. The panel is amazing, super smart people. I'm so uh, glad I can call them friends. And we do, we are doing a, a book on AI, a little different than some of the other great books that have been done. Uh, this one is really a collection of best practices from all of you. Uh, if you're interested, voicesofinnovation at gmail.com, just send an email and then you'll get feedback from there. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, the panel, you are awesome and have a super, super day. Thanks, Ed. Thank Thanks, you, Ed. Ed. Thank you, Thank panel. You. Thank you. Stay connected on BrainX community. Have a nice day.